You're listening to This Week in Cardiology from theheart.org on Medscape. You can now access the latest in medical news on your Amazon Alexa-enabled device. Join me, Perry Wilson, every weekday morning for Medscape Medical Minute, where I highlight the top medical stories of the day. To add Medscape Medical Minute to your flash briefing, search for Medscape Medical Minute on Amazon and click Enable. Or open the Amazon Alexa app, go to Skills, search for Medscape Medical Minute, and click Enable. Then say, Alexa, what's the news? Or, Alexa, what's my flash briefing? I hope you'll join us. Hi, everyone. This is John Mandrola from the Heart.org Medscape Cardiology, and this is This Week in Cardiology for March 26, 2021. This week, covid AF detection after stroke, new measures of heart function, and structural racism in quality measures. First, there's some mixed news on COVID this week. I'll start with the bad news. My friends in France and Poland and Germany and Italy tell me of increasing hospital admissions there. And you know France must be struggling because the Paris-Roubaix bike race was postponed. When I look at the very low vaccine numbers in the EU relative to the UK and to the US, I think about why that would be. I won't speculate so as not to get myself in trouble. In the US, Michigan, and New York, and New Jersey are trending up with COVID cases, which is so weird because many states are seeing continued and striking declines in cases. And I would have never thought places like Kentucky and West Virginia would ever lead any indices in health matters. But we are doing very well. Now some good news. Despite some snafus with the press release, the AstraZeneca vaccine looks quite good. Efficacy is in the high 70% range, but more importantly, get this, zero versus eight severe cases in the vaccine and placebo groups respectively. Now that is four vaccines available. And I saw a picture this week from Tel Aviv, Israel. It showed a line of shops and cafes with people acting like people. Namely, they were sitting and talking together and without masks. It looked like a pre-pandemic picture. And finally, a research letter in JAMA reported on neutralizing antibody response to four variants in infected and vaccinated individuals. The goal of the Emory-led team was to determine how mutations within the spike protein are associated with virus neutralization. And the great news was that they found, quote, neutralizing activity of infection and vaccine-elicited antibodies against four SARS-CoV-2 variants, including B1, B117, and N501Y. Next topic is AF detection after stroke. Many years ago, I heard Stanford professor John Unides remark that doctors and scientists were industry's best marketers. He showed examples of how industry disguises marketing as science. A study at the International Stroke Conference exemplifies this concept. The Stroke AF study is an industry-sponsored study comparing the use of a pricey implantable cardiac monitor to standard of care after patients who have had a recent stroke. Enrolled patients had had an ischemic stroke believed to be due to small vessel, large vessel, or intracranial atherosclerosis. Cardioembolic strokes were excluded. The study's primary endpoint was picking up greater than 30 seconds of AFib in the year after follow-up of a stroke. The mean age of enrolled patients was 67, and the mean CHADS FAST score was 5. 5. And to literally no one's surprise, 12% of those with an intracardiac monitor had AF detected versus 2% in the control arm. About 44% of the patients experienced an episode of AFib that lasted more than 4 hours, the median time to first detection of AFib was about three months. And oral anticoagulation was was prescribed more often in the ICM arm. Now, these findings led the PI to say 30 days of ambulatory cardiac monitoring, which is common practice in the U.S., even among patients with cryptogenic stroke, would have been insufficient to capture the vast majority of AFib episodes that occurred in this trial. So clearly, he said, use of ICM in this population may be beneficial to detect post-stroke AF and to inform optimal stroke prevention strategies. Okay, some comments. This trial began enrolling in 2020. 
That's four years after the Crystal AF study showed nearly the exact same thing in patients with stroke of unknown source. And eight years before that, the ASSERT study found that if you have monitors, in this case PACERs or ICDs, in patients with an elevated CHAD score, you pick up AFib in about 10% of people. In the news story from the Stroke Conference, the cited outside expert, a professor, noted Stroke AF's biggest limitation was the lack of a control group, which is weird because the control arm was the standard of care, meaning monitoring was up to the treating doctor. So this study did have a control arm. My take of the study's biggest limitation is that it doesn't tell us anything useful. Uh, we already have oodles of data that shows we will pick up incident AFib in older patients with risk factors if we monitor them. We have two trials showing that DOAX, after stroke of unknown source, does not reduce stroke rates over aspirin, navigate ESIS, and respect ESIS. So to me, this was a post-market release study that had an obvious outcome and provided no relevant information to patients or clinicians. By the process of elimination, therefore, I can only deduce that it was to make news for the company that sells expensive devices used to monitor the heart rhythm. Preventing stroke after a first stroke is an important thing to do. For this, we need studies powered to measure important clinical outcomes, not surrogate outcomes like 30 seconds of AFib. Okay, next topic, measuring heart function. JAMA Cardiology has published a new study looking at the predictive ability of subclinical measures of heart function. Now, right off the bat, you should be alert to the term subclinical which is medical jargon usually reserved for patients without complaints who are usually not seeking our help, at least yet. The paper's authors, first author Anne-Marie Reimer-Jensen, assessed the value of adding strain measures to the left ventricular ejection fraction. Strain is deformability of the LV, and too little is a bad thing. Think 20-year-olds are more deformable than 80-year-olds. Now, software in echo machines is advanced to the point where we can measure strain as longitudinal and circumferential strain, though there are lots of technical caveats. But let's first address the whole issue of left ventricular ejection fraction. Regular listeners of this podcast well know that the main problem with current day measures of the LVEF is its massive overquantification. In truth, it is an abomination to call an ejection fraction 36% or 48% or 29%. The EF varies a ton, and giving it one number is one of cardiology's biggest jokes. Doctors will say that the ejection fraction is load-dependent, but this just means if the patient is a bit dry or a bit wet, fluid-wise, the EF may vary. The EF may vary also depending on the presence of ectopy or, or heart rate. But even crazier is that the EF can vary depending on where, on a shadow, the sonographer puts the caliper, and that may vary within or between people. Now, ejection fraction would be fine measurement if it was reported like Harvey Feigenbaum taught us at Indiana in the 1990s. There, we used four categories, normal, mildly, moderately, and severely impaired. Okay, enough ranting about the folly of ejection fractions. Increasingly, my echo colleagues are telling me that my patient has abnormal strain, and this is why I was drawn to the current study in JAMA Cardiology. I'm thinking perhaps this paper published in a big-name journal is going to help me sort out what I should think when my patient's echo shows abnormal strain. Now, The authors of this paper used the ERIC database to assess the independent association of subclinical impairments in systolic performance with incident heart failure over five years. And remember that ERIC is one of those community-based prospective cohort studies in which adults are followed over time. And for this study, the exposure variables were EF, longitudinal strain, circumferential strain, measured at the fifth study visit. The outcome of interest was heart failure of any type over the next five years. Now, normally, I tell you about the patients enrolled, but in this case, I'm going to tell you first what they found, and then I'll tell you about the patients. There were about 5,000 participants, and about 3,500 of these had complete assessments of the EF and both strain measurements. The hazard ratio per one standard deviation decrease in EF was 1.41, so 41% increased risk of heart failure. 
The hazard ratio for an EF less than 60, 60 percent, was 2.59, with confidence intervals from 1.9 to 3.6. And the hazard ratio for one standard deviation decrease in longitudinal strain was similar, about 1.30, so a 30 percent increase, and it was very similar for a circumferential strain. So in sum, using current cutoffs for normal EF, which was 54% in females and 52% in men, is going to be less predictive than using uh, the EF less than 60%. Adding strain measures may also increase the prediction of future heart failure events. In an accompanying editorial, two heart failure experts, Dr. Clyde Yancey and Dr. Greg Fonero, wrote that the implications of this work were profound, profound. I asked Dr. Fonero on Twitter to expand how measuring strain will help exactly. And he wrote, quote, By identifying patients at increased risk for incident heart failure, inclusive of this older age range, can allow us to intervene with heart failure preventive therapies and risk factor interventions. Okay, maybe. But now let me tell you about Table 1 and who these patients were. Median age, 75. 81% with high blood pressure, 63% on hypertensive meds, and one-third with obesity. So maybe you can see the problem. Just being 75 years old is a risk factor for heart failure over the next five years. Dr. Fonero told me that knowing a patient's CF is below 60 or that her strain is one standard deviation too low may help me initiate therapy to help improve future heart failure. And I completely understand that notion. It's a laudable notion. But what might these therapies be? Okay, exercise. But I'd recommend that regardless of the strain measurement. A good diet. I'd recommend that regardless of the strain. Blood pressure medicines for control of blood pressure. Same. Diabetes. I'd be looking for a reason to use an SGLT2 inhibitor. Again, regardless of any measurements of this strain. And obesity. This podcast recently had a positive take on semaglutide, but would a strain measurement or an EF of 59% versus 60% really bear on that decision? But now let's consider what the harms of measuring all this LV strain could be. Let's say there's a well-meaning doctor who reads this paper, an editorial, and then thinks, gosh, my patient has both an EF less than 60 and abnormal strain and is at risk for heart failure. I better add a diuretic to the regimen. And boom, one month later, the patient is admitted for confusion due to a sodium of 125. Look, I don't mean to sound like the old doctor who's so close-minded to new stuff, but this paper does not convince me that our current paradigm is broken. Strain may have a role in the future, but we must balance the quest for perfectibility against the potential trade-offs. And herein, this reminds me of the book I am reading now by Thomas Sowell called The Conflict of Visions. Sowell speaks of the constrained versus unconstrained vision. It's a book mostly about public policy, but Sowell's visions apply well to one's approach to medicine. And both groups, constrained and unconstrained visions, want good outcomes. But the constrained vision accepts imperfection and feels that there are no perfect solutions only trade-offs. The unconstrained vision holds that with enough effort, led by really smart people, there can be great solutions. So the quest to perfect LV function measurement, or define cornea calcium, or screen for specific diseases, are examples of unconstrained vision. In other words, with enough effort, we can find solutions to human suffering. But I worry about medicalization and indication creep. I worry about the trade-offs. All right, here's an example. A promising use of LV strain may be in cardio-oncology. The unconstrained vision would have the detection of early problems from chemotherapy as a great gain. C, with enough effort, we will reduce cardiac complications of cancer therapy. But the constrained vision worries that a risk-averse cardiologist might see this strain imaging and recommend altering the cancer therapy, and that could have good or bad repercussions. Now, maybe I am naive, but it seems to me the conflicts of these visions, in medicine at least, must be resolved with empiricism. We just need the courage to recognize trade-offs. Medicine is replete with examples of things that made sense, 
but ended up not being a benefit, often due to the trade-offs. Think, for instance, of all that beautiful data a Swan-Gans catheter gave us in the ICU. And again, no benefit to Swan-Gans catheters. So I would say, if you want me to change the paradigm of caring for people using new measures of LV function, study it and show me that it is better, or at least not worse. Okay, last topic is pay for performance. Now, speaking of constrained and unconstrained vision, let's apply the two philosophies to the problem of varying quality of healthcare in hospitals. Now, variation is a problem because it implies some places are doing good work and others are doing inferior work. And everyone agrees that the goal is better quality in all hospitals. The constrained vision would accept that there is going to be some degree of variation because humans vary and they'd strive for a program of improvement with the most favorable trade-offs. The unconstrained vision believes that with the absolute smartest policy, a solution could be had that raises all hospitals up to a high level with low variation. In the U.S., government payers like CMS have instituted policies that are characterized by a stick rather than a carrot. In other words, they have tended more towards unconstrained thinking. Taken together, the policies with long names like Hospital Value-Based Purchasing Program and Hospital Readmission Reduction Programs are basically pay-for-performance measures that create penalties and bonuses for hospitals that show improvements in outcomes, say, for things like risk-adjusted reductions in 30-day readmissions. This podcast has covered this topic many times before and will again this week because JAMA has published a super important research letter describing the association between the proportion of black patients cared for in hospitals and financial penalties under these value-based payment programs. The authors are well-known policy researchers from Beth Israel in Boston and Washington University in St. Louis. The first author is Raul Agarwal. The research question is whether these initiatives disparately affect hospitals that care for a high proportion of black patients. Translation, is there a terrible trade-off in this policy? The key result of their findings was that after adjustment for hospital characteristics, including being a safety net hospital, high proportion black hospitals were more likely, more likely than other hospitals to be penalized and less likely to receive a bonus. Senior author Rishi Wadera had a nice thread on Twitter, which I will link to. Wadera noted that already a large body of evidence suggests that these pay-for-performance programs have not meaningfully improved hard outcomes. But now this paper suggests these programs contribute to structural racism by disproportionately levying financial penalties on already under-resourced hospitals. Crucially, Wadera notes these deleterious structural effects are totally unintentional. But that's the thing that highlights the tension between constraint and unconstrained visions. The constrained vision holds that there are no perfect interventions. The trade-offs must be considered. And just like every time, every time I've mentioned these policies, I ask you to imagine a world in which pay-for-performance policies were studied in pragmatic trials before being implemented. If that was done, we would have likely known about these problems and lack of effect on clinical outcomes before exposing millions of people to them. Smart people making policy with the best of intentions are not enough. Empiricism must also apply to policy measures. So that's it for this week in cardiology. As always, I'm grateful that you listened. Thank you. And remember, friends, if you like this podcast, please, please, it really helps to give us a rating or a review. That helps others find us. Until next week, this is John Mandrola from theheart.org. Medscape Cardiology. You're listening to This Week in Cardiology from the Heart.org on Medscape.